Cryptic Canticles welcomes you to the Dracula Radio Play experience. Sit back, relax, and enjoy this full audio performance of Bram Stoker's masterpiece, released chronologically by entry date. Jonathan Harker's Journal. Later. The morning of 16 May. God preserve my sanity, for to this I am reduced. Safety, and the assurance of safety, are things of the past. Whilst I live on here, there is but one thing to hope for, that if I may not go mad, indeed, if I be not mad already, if I be sane, then surely it is maddening to think of all the foul things that lurk in this hateful place the Count is the least dreadful to me, that to him alone I can look for safety, even though this be only whilst I can serve his purpose. Great God, merciful God, let me be calm, for out of the way lies madness indeed. I begin to get new lights on certain things which have puzzled me. Up till now I never quite knew what Shakespeare meant when he made Hamlet say, My tablets, quick, my tablets, tis meet that I put it down, etc. For now, feeling as though my own brain were unhinged, or as if the shock had come which must end in its undoing, I turn to my diary for repose. The habit of entering accurately must help to soothe me. The Count's mysterious warning frightened me at the time. It frightens me more not when I think of it, for in the future he has a fearful hold upon me. I shall fear to doubt what he may say. When I had written in my diary, and had fortunately replaced the book and pen in my pocket, I felt sleepy. The Count's warning came into my mind, but I took pleasure in disobeying it. The sense of sleep was upon me, and with it the obstinacy which sleep brings as outrider. The soft moonlight soothed, and the wide expanse without gave a sense of freedom which refreshed me. I determined not to return tonight to the gloom-haunted rooms, but to sleep here where, of old, ladies had sat and sung and lived sweet lives whilst their gentle breasts were sad for their menfolk away in the midst of remorseless wars. I drew a great couch out of its place near the corner, so that as I lay, I could look at the lovely view to east and south, and, unthinking of and uncaring for the dust, composed myself for sleep. I suppose that I must have fallen asleep. I hope so. But I fear, for all that followed was so startlingly real, so real that now sitting here in the broad, full sunlight of the morning, I cannot in the least believe that I was all sleep. I was not alone. The room was the same, unchanged in any way since I came to it. I could see along the floor, in the brilliant moonlight, my own footsteps marked where I had disturbed the long accumulation of dust. In the moonlight opposite me were three young women, ladies by their dress and manner. I thought at the time that I must be dreaming when I saw them, for they threw no shadow on the floor. They came close to me, and looked at me for some time, and then whispered together. Two were dark, and had high aquiline noses like the Count and great, dark, piercing eyes that seemed to be almost red when contrasted with the pale yellow moon. The other was fair, as fair as can be, with great masses of golden hair and eyes like pale sapphires. I seemed somehow to know her face, knew it in the connection with some dreamy fear, but I could not recollect at the moment how or where. All three had brilliant white teeth that shone like pearls against the ruby of their voluptuous lips. There was something about them that made me uneasy, some longing and at the same time some deadly fear. I felt in my heart a wicked, burning desire that they would kiss me with those red lips. It is not good to note this down, lest some day it should meet Mina's eyes and cause her pain, but it is the truth. They whispered together, and then they all three laughed. <laughs> Such a silvery, musical laugh, but as hard as though the sound could never have come through the softness of human lips. It was like the intolerable, tinkling sweetness of water glasses when played on by a cunning hand. The fair girl shook her head coquettishly, and the other two urged her on. <laughs> Go on, 
You are first and we shall follow. Yours is the right to begin. He is young and strong. There are kisses for us all. I lay quiet, looking out from under my eyelashes in an agony of delightful anticipation. The fair girl advanced and bent over me till I could feel the movement of her breath upon me. Sweet it was in one sense, honey sweet, and sent the same tingling through the nerves as her voice, but with a bitter underlying the sweet, a bitter offensiveness as one smells in blood. I was afraid to raise my eyelids, but looked out and saw perfectly under the lashes. The girl went on her knees and bent over me, simply gloating. It was a deliberate voluptuousness which was both thrilling and repulsive, and as she arched her neck, she actually licked her lips like an animal, till I could see in the moonlight the moisture shining on the scarlet lips and on the red tongue as it lapped the white, sharp teeth. Lower and lower went her head as the lips went below the range of my mouth and chin and seemed to fasten on my throat. Then she paused, and I could hear the churning sound of her tongue as it licked her teeth and lips, and I could feel the hot breath on my neck. Then the skin of my throat began to tingle, as one's flesh does when the hand that it is to tickle it approaches nearer, nearer. I could feel the soft, shivering touch of the lips on the super-sensitive skin of my throat and the hard dents of two sharp teeth just touching and pausing there. I closed my eyes in languorous ecstasy and waited, waited with beating heart. But at that instant, another sensation swept through me as quick as lightning. I was conscious of the presence of the Count and of his being as if lapped in a storm of fury. As my eyes opened involuntarily, I saw his strong hand grasp the slender neck of the fair woman, and with giant's power draw it back. The blue eyes transformed with fury, the white teeth champing with rage, and the fair cheeks blazing red with passion. But the Count, never did I imagine such wrath and fury, even to the demons of the pit. His eyes were positively blazing, the red light in them was lurid, as if the fires of hell blazed behind them. His face was deathly pale, and the lines of it were drawn hard like wires. The thick eyebrows that met over the nose now seemed like a heaving bar of white-hot metal. With a fierce sweep of his arm, he hurled the woman from him, and then motioned to the others as though he were beating them back. It was the same imperious gesture I had seen used to the wolves in a voice which, though low and almost in a whisper, seemed to cut through the air and then ring in the room, he said, How dare you touch him, any of you? How dare you cast eyes on him when I had forbidden it? Back, I tell you all, this man belongs to me. Beware how you meddle with him, or you'll have to deal with me. The fair girl, with a laugh of ribald coquetry, turned to answer him. <laughs> you yourself never loved. You never love. On this, the other women joined, and such a mirthless, hard, soulless laughter rang through the room that it almost made me faint to hear. It seemed like the pleasure of fiends. Then, the Count turned, after looking at my face attentively, and said in a soft whisper, Yes, I too can love. You yourselves can tell it from the past. Is it not so? Well, now I promise you that when I am done with him, you shall kiss him at your will. Now go. Go, I must awaken him, for there is work to be done. Are we to have nothing tonight? <laughs> Said one of them with a low laugh as she pointed to the bag which he had thrown upon the floor and which moved as though there was something living within it. For answer, he nodded his head. One of the women jumped forward and opened it. If all my ears did not deceive me, there was a gasp and a low wail, as of a half-smothered child. The women closed round. Whilst I was aghast with horror, but as I looked, 
they disappeared, and with them the dreadful bag. There was no door near them, and they could not have passed me without my noticing. They simply seemed to fade into the rays of the moonlight and pass out through the window, for I could see outside the dim, shadowy forms for a moment before they entirely faded away. Then the horror overcame me, and I sank down, unconscious. Jonathan Harker's journal continued. I awoke in my own bed. If it be that I had not dreamt, the Count must have carried me here. I tried to satisfy myself on the subject, but could not arrive at any unquestionable result. To be sure, there were certain small evidences, such as that my clothes were folded and laid by in a manner which was not my habit. My watch was still unwound, and I am rigorously accustomed to wind it the last thing before going to bed, and many such details. But these things are no proof, for they may have been evidences that my mind was not as usual, and for some cause or another I had certainly been much upset. I must watch for proof. Of one thing I am glad. If it was that the Count carried me here and undressed me, he must have been hurried in his task, for my pockets are intact. I am sure that this diary would have been a mystery to him which he would not have brooked. He would have taken or destroyed it. As I look round this room, although it has been to me so full of fear, it is now a sort of sanctuary, for nothing can be more dreadful than those awful women who were, who are, waiting to suck my blood. You have been listening to Bram Stoker's Dracula, the radio play, as presented by the Cryptic Canticles. Stay tuned for our next episode at crypticcanticles.com.